I just point? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll start. What have you seen here, or not seen, which is probably more important, okay. that you think should be added that these folks need before they get out of here in two, three years' time to get themselves work? Wow. What's missing? Your well, you got HD cameras. <laughs> you got HD cameras and you went to a Mac lab, so that's good. Um, Jillian was kind enough to give me what she called the two, the two cent tour, which was like $200 tour. You know, I mean, I saw everything. Um, look, I, I think facilities wise, you can get better lights, right? Yeah, you know, who cares? Um, that stuff happens. There's infrastructure, there's over. Yeah, uh, that's where I was going with it, is that, look, I, I, think, I think that interdisciplinary studies, um, what you guys have done that's been very impressive is you've set up a, 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 a number of verticals, and a number of disciplines. You know, you film and broadcast and journalism and marketing and public relations and children's entertainment and integrated, what is it, the engineering dynamic design integration system management program? <laughs> Engineering design. Um, I, I think these are especially things, things like that, like look, robotics and, the, and children's entertainment because, you know, how do you, like, how do you really make a difference? You know, teach kids. Um, but, and I don't know the answer to this, so it's a suggestion, is that integrating these and going interdisciplinary um, is where it's at. Because if you're studying film and you don't think you need marketing, you're nuts. Uh, especially if you're in the independent film world. Um, if you're in graphic design and you're not talking to the game guys, you're nuts because they're gonna be your bosses. You know, your talent, their suit. Um, so I think that especially in the way the world is changing from audience distribution and content and how digital in all of its machinations, whether it's YouTube to MySpace to Comcast to Rogers. Um, you have to know it all. You have to know it all. And everybody should be playing in everybody's sandbox. Um, because the thing that I learned, and I studied film before there was an internet, before there was YouTube, before there was any of those things. Um, and look, I've been on, I've made giant movies, but that's not the point. You know, you have something to say, you have tools that can help you say them. And if you're painting a picture and you hang it in your basement, you know, that's not an artist. You know, uh, I mean, it's art, but it's not an artist. Um, you have to get your stuff seen, heard. And that's marketing, that's PR, that's journalism. That's, 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 that's. So I think that the key to any artistic program is everybody playing in everybody's sa sandbox and leveraging um, the interdisciplinary help to get it out there because, man, you know, if you're a journalist, you've got to have something to say. Well, you can be writing about the film guys, but the film guys and the film gals need to be using the marketing people to get their work out there. And, you know, and, and I, I, I don't know whether you, how much you guys are leaning into social media, um, as, as, meaning digital social media, because today, you know, that's the key. I mean, the reason Bruno bombed and Star Trek did well was the tweets right out of the first day. Um, Bruno normally, three years ago, would have gotten probably crappy reviews, and, that, and then Sasha, whatever his, Aaron Cohen, you know, whatever his middle name is, he would have used that in the press and gone on TMZ or gone on ET and said, that's why everybody needs to see my movie because it's so bad. Well, that's still spin. Right? So three years ago, it would have been, it doesn't matter what the critics say, it would have been spun. But millions of people walked out of that movie, pulled out their iPhones and went, that sucked. Bam. Then it's on everybody's Twitter pages and all of a sudden 30 million people go, oh, I'm not going to go see it. And the movie died after one day. One day. So it's changing that fast. And guess what? Twitter's here today. Something will be tomorrow. So I think that integrating that kind of strategy across interdisciplinary is, is really important. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I did my undergraduate work at the University of Denver in Denver, Colorado, a small private university. Um, it, had, it has a very good uh, restaurant management school, very good business school. Um, I studied English and communications. 
Um, directly after school, I taught poetry in a high school. I wanted to be Mr. Keaton, or Mr. whatever his name was from Dead Poet Society. Um, then I went to graduate school, and I did a master's in film and a PhD in poetry at the same time, and then right after that, I started writing. Um, I also was a professional triathlete on the side, which was weird. So, um, <laughs> so I was doing Ironmans and then writing poetry and then writing articles because I was going out and I was writing scripts and I was doing it just as badly as everybody else. Um, and look, the thing about, about writing in general is that, so I wrote is the answer to the question. And the thing about writing in general is that writing is writing, right? That's all it is. Writing is writing. You know, you should, I mean, it's like you can go to a Starbucks in Hollywood and you can spit in any direction and you hit a writer. Um, well, are they right? And then you go up to them and you say, so can I read it? Oh, no, no, well, it's, you know, then you're not a writer, right? Um, so I just wrote voraciously. I just wrote anything and everything and anything. And I wrote TV and I wrote screenplays and then I didn't make any money. Um, so I wrote articles. Um, I wrote, I, I was a triathlete, so I wrote articles about triathlons. Um, I was interested in the arts and politics, so I did some stringing and I did some freelance journalism for like the Washington Post and stuff. Um, but I tripped and fell along for a lot of years, you know. So, but I just I wanted to be a writer, and I figured that writers write, so I just wrote a lot. So. Hell yes. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Well, it, the thing is, is that, look, if it bombs because, because it sucked and you were trying to make money, then you're screwed, right? Then your reputation goes down the toilet. And then you can't live with yourself, and then you can't sleep at night, because you're just trying to make money, right? It was a, it was a career move. If it bombs because nobody saw it because, you know, market forces, act of God, whatever, who cares? You know, I mean, the first, the first, movie, the first movie we made a participant was a little movie called American Gun, all right? And it was the right movie to make. So you got a billionaire who invests $1 million in a movie. It didn't matter. A million dollars, hundred million dollars, it didn't matter. We had Donald Sutherland, Marsha Gay Harden, uh, Nikki Reed, Tony Goldwyn. Who else? Who else was in this movie? Like five other people in this movie. Hugh, oh, Forrest Whitaker, right? So three Academy Award winners in a $2 million movie. That was about, it was kind of like traffic for handguns. It was three stories that were woven in around the way that the access to fear of proliferation of handguns in America can rip the fabric of society. Brilliant screenplay by a 22-year-old that had just come out of Loyola Marymount Film School. He wanted to direct it. And so we backed him. And IFC, um, they, uh, Independent Film Channel and, and their studio, backed it. We put in a million, they put in a million. They distributed it. Um, we believed in the movie, and no one saw it at all, ever. It bombed, right? Am I proud as hell of it? Yeah, I am. What did it mean for us at our company is that whether it's a $100 million movie with George Clooney or it's a $2 million movie, we made a movie. You know? And I think that the thing you have to do is that if you accomplish something, if you finish, right? Finishing is hard, man. It's hard to really, it's really hard to finish something. If you finish it and it bombs and you're proud of it, Screw the critics. Screw what everybody says. You did it. You know, people say, oh, the movie sucks. Really? How's your movie doing? <laughs> really? How's, the, how's those movies you've never made? Right? That's, I mean, my God, making a movie is so hard. It's so devastatingly hard. You make a movie and it sucks, you still win. <laughs> right? Because you've made a movie. Um, <laughs> so I think, and I think the way you pick yourself up is you don't listen to a damn thing anybody says. Because, you know, dude, you screwed up. 
you know, there's all that. And then your mother saying, I knew you were gonna marry me, you know, and then, and there's all that, sh that crap, right? Sorry. I curse a lot, so I'm, so I'm really gonna try to tone it down. Um, look, if you know it bombed because you didn't put your heart into it, that's your problem. But if it bombed and you put your heart into it, it's not your problem. You'll do it again. You know? Because look, you've lit something inside of you, and the flame doesn't go out. So, but yeah, I mean, it's hard. You, know? <laughs> you get flattened. I mean, when I left participant productions, you know, it's, I mean, I tell this story a lot. So, you know, I started the company and saw it through, right? And my wife and I had a baby, and we won four Academy Awards in the same month. What are you going to do next? Right? Like, it's all downhill from there. You know? <laughs> I'm a new father. It's the miracle of birth. It's the miracle of being a parent. Four Academy Awards. All this stuff. And so I left because I figured, wow, I've kind of accomplished my goals. I finished. 95% of the people that I knew in Hollywood stopped returning my calls the next day. Because I'm not associated with a billionaire anymore. I'm not interesting anymore. Devastating. Really hard on your ego. Because, so, on a m Sunday, I'm an Academy Award winner. On a Monday, I'm a loser. You know, I, like, I haven't changed. My talent hasn't changed. If anything, in the f f four years, four years since participant, three and a half years since participant, I've seen more, I've grown more, I've done more. The films I'm making now, now I think, are more interesting in many ways. But um, I hung in there, and I did other things. Um, I decided not to stay in the film industry, um, and now that I'm back, what's interesting is the 5% five, five that I kept were all I needed. That was it. All the other ones were jerk off, and they don't matter. Exactly, yeah. And even if you leave on top, it's the best way to find out how your friends are. So, so okay, next question. Yes? Oh, man. The higher up you go, the more the investor influence, the harder it is to deal with. Um, <coughs> investors are their agony and ecstasy. Um, sorry? Investors are agony and ecstasy. Um, if you're talking specifically about investors in creativity, um, there's, two t there's two types. Um, there's types that want to take what you have and make it their own, and there's others that want to go to parties. The ones who want to go to parties are actually the better ones. They're actually the better ones because they're stupid and they're, um, they're just frivolous. You can kind of keep them over here, right? It's the ones who want to be you, that's the problem. Um, however, having said that, look, I have a simple philosophy about if you have something, if you're building a website, if you are starting a company, if you are making a movie, if you are starting a partnership, and you need money, and you cannot do it on revenue. You cannot do it because you can't sell what you have right up front. Take the money. Take it. Because if you're serious about it, I mean, I, I talk to people a lot, especially who are starting up .com. And, you know, well, I'm going to write a business plan, and I'm going to go to the VCs. And because I'm brilliant, they're going to throw money at me. I'm like, wow, not 1997 anymore. Um, and I say, how bad do you want it? Like, seriously, how bad do you want it? They go, what do you mean? Will you mortgage, take a second mortgage out on your house? Will you max your credit cards? Will you work three jobs? How bad do you want it? Because that's the only way it'll start. Nobody invests in something that's not rolling, right? Um, so. How do you manage investors? Tell them the truth, okay? Um, don't snow them because they're smart. How do you know they're smart? They have more money than you. <laughs> um, if somebody's going to invest $100,000 in your film, guess what? They're your boss. And the best way you can handle investors, whether you're in a multi-billion dollar corporation or you're making a little student film or a little independent movie, just be honest with them. Do your homework. Get people to run the numbers. And this is back to that interdisciplinary thing. You're a bunch of creators in here. I'm assuming there's not a, I mean, 
So maybe there's not a line producing class. Is there? You should get one. <laughs> or get the economic students, get the statistical analysis students, get the math geeks over on the other campus to work with you guys to put together a budget that you can stick to. Because the worst thing in the world is you go, you sit in a room with an investor and you say, I, I need 100 grand. And they go, mm. and all I need is 80. Oh, well, 50. 50, because you're just so happy to be here. You know, you just, right? How much money do you really need? If you don't know, you're dead. Because guess what? If you're passionate enough, that investor will give you the money. And if you're 50 grand off either way, you're screwed, right? So I just think you've got to be really, 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 really honest. And um, just ask for money. The hardest thing in the world to do is to stare somebody in the eye and ask for money. We all want to be entouraged into big rooms and have people go, well, my client, you know, who has done nothing <laughs> and uh, has an idea. You know, we all want somebody else to do it, okay? It doesn't happen. Um, I just had to raise a million dollars for a company that's based here in Toronto. Um, and look, I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars for other people and other companies. This was me. This is a little tiny, tiny company that I believed in so desperately that I flew around the world on my own dime, took my college, my kids' college savings fund, my 401k, my IRA, and I took a second mortgage out of my house. I spent $250,000 in 2008 of my own money to try to raise a million dollars for this company. It doesn't make me noble. How bad do I want it? And I had to sit down with a group of guys in Melbourne, Australia, real estate developers who had never invested in technology before. And I had all the numbers and the business plan and the spreadsheets and the financial projections. And I had this and that and everything. At the end of the day, I said, look, dude, it's me. OK? It's me. And it hasn't been easy. You know, back to your question. It hasn't been easy. There have been big screw-ups. And I have to deal with them, you know? So be honest, be honest, be honest. But most of all, just ask for it. You know, if you've got something, like don't ask for the money before the no, you know what you, you know what you want to do. You know, I'm a filmmaker. I need money. What for? You know? <laughs> Have something. If you believe in it bad enough to ask your mom, to ask your cousin, to ask your friend, to go online, to set up a Facebook page and try to get donations, that's brave. And I think it takes courage to deal with investors. So did that help? Did that answer the question? Okay, what's the other half? Sorry. I'm going off on a tangent. The other half is the initial your Welcome to Hollywood. Um, here's the thing. No one except George Lucas and, Ma Ma and Mel Gibson don't have influence on them. If you think, you know, Spielberg or Singleton or anybody, if you think that their studio executives aren't breaking their balls, you're wrong. Okay, because it's about the poster. It's not about the movie. It's about the bed sheets. It's about the sequel. It's about the franchise, right? It's about the franchise. So the way to get a job in Hollywood is be employable. Okay? And this is what happens all the time. Well, I'm I'm so brilliant that I'm gonna break them all. Ha! Ah! I'm so unique. My voice is so unique that I'm going to do it different. Never in a million years. The, the films you love, okay, are paint by numbers. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? There's, there's, you know, there's the inciting incident. There's the personal, there's the private, and there's the professional life story. Then there's the inciting incident. Then it's first act turn. Then there's all the complications, man versus man, man versus environment, man versus self, man versus politics, man versus, you know. Then there's the climax, which is always a life or death. It's an epiphanal moment. It's about confrontation. It's about climax, and then it resolves. It's paint by numbers. Every single movie is paint by numbers. All the same. It's Aristotle, right? It's Aristotle. The magic is when you can take that spine and do something original, have original characters, original voice, have an original project. And then you convince investors who are going to ride your ass 
every single step of the way because you're in the genius business. They're in the making money from you business. That's it, okay? We did a company that was based on leveraging the power of the media. Make no mistake, if Syriana had lost money, you know, we didn't care, but they did. And we wrestled over that poster for six months. The reason Kite Runner failed was because the kid in Kite Runner, you guys see the movie? Okay, the little kid? There was actually, then, you know, we made Kite Runner and the war hit. And we had to get the kid out, okay? The film was timed, the release of the film was timed with actually, it, it, it was it, like you couldn't have planned it better if you tried. They were gonna go and like send in freaking Marines to get this kid out, okay? And the film was gonna come out that week. And the marketing people panicked. Went, ah, what are you nuts? So that's how bad they screw with you. But the thing is, is look, and look, at the risk of sounding crass, okay? Um, you bend over once. Okay? Siri, you do it. And you do it smiling. Okay? You do it smiling because then you get to do what you want. So that's how Lucas did it. Whether or not you liked the next three Star Wars, okay, which I didn't, because um, I was 11 when the first one came out. It was awesome. Um, he did it himself, right? So that's that kind of like walled garden type thing where it's like crazy mad genius doing his own thing. But he got to do his own thing because he has the money. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't get to make those movies on his own because he's a genius. Fight battles you can win. That's a big lesson. Whether you're in PR, you're in marketing, you're in social networking, you're in digital media, you're in whatever. Fight battles you can win because here's the trick to investors. They're gonna say no to everything. So let them have some things that you know they're gonna say no to and do a little fake fight over here. Like, oh no, I really need that. I need the crane. I need the crane shot. Yeah, well, it's $900 an hour. Yeah, but I need it. Well, you can't have it. Oh. All right, fake. Because what you really wanted way over here, right? What you really wanted is a night shoot. You really wanted a night shoot. Fake them. Okay, they need to win. So you need to give them their pound of fun. And you can do night shoots without permits. You know, if you're moving fast enough, a crane draws attention. So. <laughs> yeah, crane at night. There you go. Um, so I think, look, investors are all the same. They're in it to make money. God bless them. So work with them because they're empowering you. You know? And there's good ones and there's bad ones, right? And you've got to go through a lot of bad ones to get to the good ones. And when you find a good one, yeah, stick with them. Make them money. You know, um, I love documentaries across the board, and I think they've—I think the reason they're doing well is because they're growing up. Um, I think that the days of um, almost kind of shocking objectivity are are changing. And look, there's there's a bunch of schools that documentaries should be non-intrusive. There should be no kind of influence and stuff like that. But the world's a different place. And I think that docs like Fahrenheit 911, you know, whether you like it or not. Look, an inconvenient truth cost $2 million and it made $300 million in the box office, right? That's a good deal. And that does a lot for docs because there's only one. Like, you know, there, it's, it's this, docs and, the, and features are the same. It's, you know, everybody says, well, I'm going to make a movie and it's going to be like my big, big, big winning. I'm going to make an independent movie and it's going to make $300 million. Right? Well, there's 40,000 billion zillion other movies that never got seen, just like An Inconvenient Truth, right? Um, World According to Sesame Street, my favorite documentary we made at Participant Nobody Saw, ever, you know? But what I think is interesting about documentaries is that, do is that the concept of documentary filmmaking is YouTube. It's UGC, right? I think that the problem with documentaries in the past is that there was no way for normal people regular old people to experience it. 
um, they didn't, it wasn't tactile. Um, it, it's, it's interesting that YouTube is filled with documentary style user generated content. It's like, here's me and my buddies, right? Well, that's a doc that's, you're documenting. Um, I think that Lionsgate is doing some wonderful things. I think that, that Summit is doing some wonderful things. I think that An Inconvenient Truth, Fahrenheit, and some other ones, Born in the Brothel, um, have done some wonderful things for documentary. And look, they're such an important art form. They're so, so important. And I, but I just think that there's a generation of people growing up that understand what documentaries are as opposed to being these weird PBS things. Um, that now it's not spooky, scary, weird, marginal anymore. It's like, oh yeah, it's a doc. Docs are cool. So, um, I mean, I'm, I, I think there should be a lot more of them. They're really hard to make, ungodly hard to make, because they're all editing mediums, as you know. Um, but I do think that this is one of the places that the digital age and the internet has helped an entire genre of art, because we're used to seeing stuff now that is documentary style. 